Check one, two, there it is. Just had a delay. <laughs> to the melody. I'll show you one of my where it's like, okay, I'm verse one and one, I play melody. Then I go on verse two. I have to go up to um, the desk camp. Verse three, I'm supposed to be out. Verse four, I'm supposed to be on melody. And then verse five, I'm on desk camp. So I have arrows going. Yeah. Mine's straightforward. <laughs> Luckily. Otherwise, I'd probably be lost. <laughs> playing the intro twice. Ask him if, he, if I should play the first time also. I know uh, when, the, when they're singing with us, I come in the second time. And I didn't write it down. Uh, if I, on, the gathering. on the gathering version, do I come in? Yes, but on the intro yeah. when we're playing it twice, do you want me to still yeah, not it seems like play it's either it the cool. first time, it seems like yeah. but play it the yeah. second yeah. time? Yeah. Okay, so both times then, I am when they're doing it. Okay. Thank you. Because it sounds good, it just it, it gets that like, buzz when I'm not playing, you know, it should be a big thing.
Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. I'm always happy to see people the Sunday after Thanksgiving because I feel like I'm always exhausted and would rather just sleep in. So <laughs> glad to have you all here this morning. Thanks for those joining online. Just a few announcements before we get started. Um, Eric, Pastor Eric is taking the day off today, so you won't see him in worship this morning. I know, right? Yay. <laughs> um, and I want to give a big thank you to all the people who helped out in putting the Thanksgiving meal together for Harbor House. Um, we were only told to make enough food for like 25 to 30, but I think we made enough for like 40 to 45. Oh, <laughs> Maya handed it out, so she's like, yay, there was enough. <laughs> right? Yeah, okay. Cool. Um, and then, sorry, did you say something? Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. And then uh, the, um, we had a ton of pies from the uh, interfaith service from the night before the Thanksgiving interfaith service. So that was really nice because we could literally hand out all the pie you could imagine. There was so much pie. It was ridiculous. So that was really exciting. So thank you for all of your help in uh, supporting that and making that happen. Um, we also have the art auction that is currently going on. It is an online art auction to help support our youth, our youth program to go on their trips and all of the things that, all the activities that they do together. So uh, if you didn't already, you know, make your bids online. They make great Christmas gifts. Um, but the, uh, there are flyers in the narthex if you need one of those. And it's also in the churchwide email that went out. There's a link directly in there that will take you to the auction site. Um, and a lot, all of the art is made by members of our own church, so that's kind of cool too. Uh, and lastly, we do have um, Advent starts next week. So we have, <laughs> thank you, we have all of our, if you look in the back of the sanctuary here, we have our Advent calendars that you can take home. One is a little more kid-friendly, it includes coloring. Right, and then the other one is just if you don't want to color, <laughs> basically. It's just kind of a prompts for each day leading all the way up until Christmas. So those are in the narthex if you want to grab one on your way out. And we also have devotion booklets that go along with our Advent theme that we're doing, um, which is how does a weary world rejoice? And we'll talk about ways that a weary world rejoices um, throughout the season of Advent and even into the Christmas season as well. So I think, oh, and there's decorating today. In order to get ready for Advent and Christmas, we have to decorate the sanctuary. Uh, and so Brian, we're meeting at two o'clock, right? One, oh, one o'clock, sorry, my timing was wrong. We're meeting at one o'clock here. Um, so go grab your lunch and come on back and help us decorate. We have a big old, bunch of big old trees to put up and um, there are lots of people who will kind of tell you what to do if you've never done it before. So we would love your help with that. I think that's it from the announcements. I invite you to please rise in body or spirit for our call to worship. Our God is within us, beside us, and all around us. We gather to seek God together. And when we seek God together, we grow in faith together. May our worship today be a time of growth and discovery of God's presence in our lives and in our world. Let us sing.
worship together, we have the opportunity to release, to let go of the things that weigh heavy on our hearts, and to admit to the ways that we have not lived as we are called. In this time of confession and opening of our hearts, let us remember that God is ready to receive, eager to offer grace, and hopeful in the possibilities of our lives. Let us pray. O oh God, you asked for our hands that you might use them for your purpose. We gave them for a moment, then withdrew them, for the work was hard. You asked for our mouths to speak out against injustice. We gave you a whisper that we might not be accused. You asked for our eyes to see the pain of poverty. We closed them, for we did not want to see. You asked for our lives that you might work through each of us. We gave a small part that we might not get too involved. Lord, forgive our calculated efforts to serve you only when it feels convenient and easy. Help us to release our complacency, our guilt, our fears and frustrations. Fill us up, O oh God. Heal our bodies and souls, our minds and hearts so that we will be free to serve and love and dream and be. Beloveds, you are beautiful. May you believe this day in the beauty that God sees in you. Know that you are forgiven this day and every day so that with a heart filled up with grace and love, you might feel, feel freed and empowered to offer the same gifts to others. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Share a sign of peace with one another. Letter C. Servant on.
Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Gracious God, we are thankful that you are not some God far away, but that you draw near to us. You are beside us in every part of every day. We ask today that you help us see opportunities to be your hands, feet, mouth, and ears in this world. May we seek out opportunities to support each other. May we find ways to study your word together. May we be people who welcome others into a relationship with you. And may we find ways to serve you by serving others. We love you and praise you for who you are and how you continue to transform our lives. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. The first reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 9. Now in Joppa, there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. At that time, she became ill and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in a room upstairs. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples who heard that Peter was there, sent two men to him with the request, please come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them, and when he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter put all of them outside, and then he knelt down and prayed. He turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. Then she opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then calling the saints, the saints and widows, he showed her to be alive. This became known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Meanwhile, he stayed in Joppa for some time with a certain Simon, a tanner. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God.
Please stand as we read good news from John. After he had washed their feet and put on his robe and had reclined again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. These are the stories of our people and our God. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. So for our last week in our series on Seeking God Together, which we started quite a while ago, I think it was like 12 weeks ago, <laughs> so we've been on it for a really long time, uh, before we enter into Advent and the Christmas season, um, is last but certainly not least, the concept of serving. Seeking God Together through service. We began this series by thinking about how God is within us, about how and why we pray, how to make time and to make room for God, and thinking about the more personal, maybe even what we might consider to be the more private relationship with God. And then we moved into the more public aspects of faith, sensing and wondering about God's presence all around us as we give thanks together, as we marvel at God's existence, as we confess and lament and even celebrate together. And finally, we moved to how our faith and our relationship with God impacts our relationship with others. And maybe I would even add vice versa, how our relationships with one another might also impact our faith and our relationship with God. Now on our journey through life and faith, we're called to support one another, to study the word together, however that appears, to welcome and to make room for all at our table. And it all comes to culminate in this week about serving. It's important for our own well-being and for the well-being of others and how the joy that we experience in the love of God comes through in the ways that we serve one another, in the ways we serve together, or even find ourselves being served. We get this ultimate view of service as Jesus kneels at the feet of his friends in our gospel reading today, when do we typically read this story? Anybody know their church season super well? <laughs> Monday, Thursday, Janet's got it, all right. <laughs> uh, yeah, so Monday, Thursday is when we usually read it. So he's having a meal with his friends, he, with his disciples, right? He knows that the time of his death is very near, Right? And on Monday, Thursday, sometimes we even go so far as to wash one another's feet, if you're so brave. Right? Um, but his friends and disciples have been on quite the journey with him, yet they need to hear this particular lesson. And not only hear it, but they need to experience it. So Jesus washes their feet. And we don't read this part of the passage today, but just a few verses earlier, Peter says, You'll never wash my feet, Jesus. No, no, no. Washing the feet was the work of the servants. And typically, not just any servant, it was the work of the female servants. So like, you know, bottom of the barrel, right? That's the idea we're supposed to get out of this. So it's a lowly job. And Jesus takes on the work of a female servant, making this, in the men's eyes, an even more humiliating act. Within these dynamics of ancient culture, this is the reality. But Jesus doesn't stop. He knows exactly what he's doing, right? He is changing up the roles. He is acting against their expectations. He is widening the table. He is shifting the systems of power that are at play. And they have no idea. <laughs> he says, you call me teacher and Lord, and that is right, for that is what I am. So if I have done this for you, if I've done this for you, you need to do it for each other. I need you to kneel at each other's feet. I need you to help dismantle the powers that be. I need you to serve, not by telling others what to do, by standing lofty and high above them, pointing out where they're supposed to go. No, I need you to get your hands and your feet 
and your knees a little bit dirty because you're equal with one another, with everyone. So switch, switch up the roles. Break the system. Break it. Show people by walking a different path, by washing the disciples' feet. Jesus isn't just preparing them for his death. This isn't just one last lesson before Jesus dies. This is saying, we live in a really power-hungry world. We live in a world where evil takes the form of one person being valued over another, where hierarchy and money and possessions are more important than the love of our neighbor, where, all, where you are only welcomed into community if you have the money to pay into it. So could it be that an act of love and such an act of humility, like washing one another's feet, could this begin to push back against the corrosive expectations of the world? Could it be that acts such as this, role reversals like this, could bring us closer to God's dream for humanity? So in our gospel reading, we have Jesus taking on what would typically be the role of a female servant in this time and place, and Peter rejects it, not fully understanding the implications. And then in our reading from Acts, we have Peter performing a miracle, calling Tabitha, a woman, back to life. So it feels like these stories have to be connected in some way or another. So let's get into Tabitha's story just a little bit. Anybody know what her name means? It's kind of a cool name. It means gazelle. She's a gazelle, right? It's lovely. Okay. So Tabitha is the only woman explicitly named as a disciple in the New Testament. The only woman. She is a, a woman who, based on her reputation of being no, is known for her good deeds for her giving of alms, which means she has a little bit of means, right? She has a little bit of money. So she cares for widows in her community and seemingly forms this family of women around her. So when she dies and Peter arrives after being called upon, because they're like, oh, Peter's in the town next to us? Like, go get him. Maybe he can do something about this. So they go get Peter, and he comes back, and this family of widows, they all gather around to show Peter what she has done. Now, if we go back to Acts 6, there is this story about the church specifically choosing seven men to do the work of caring for widows in Jerusalem. They would be called deacons, which we use that title in the church even today. And we never get a story of Tabitha receiving such a title. She did the work simply because she had the means to do it. Tabitha is a disciple because of the work she is doing. She is caring for those on the margins, and in this time and in this place that happened to be the widows in her community. So her worth and her value of her work was not determined by her wealth. It was certainly not determined by her gender or the children she bared or the man she married or the food she cooked. Tabitha impacted the lives of the community of women through her compassion, and the ways that she cared for them. So maybe not named as an official leader by the church, by the official church, right? But she was certainly valued as integral in caring for the most vulnerable in her part of the world. Tabitha shows us that when we serve others, we are saying to people that you matter and you are valued and you are important because you are a beloved of God. Now, Peter goes from arguing, and I'd even say go so far as, um, he, he, I would even go so far as to say that he rejects what Jesus was doing because of how humiliating it was for Jesus to be taking on the role of a female servant. He's shocked by this absurdity and humiliation. So he goes from that to performing a miracle in order to see a woman serving the church, valued so deeply by the people around her, restored to her community. So Peter has surely been on a journey right, to discover what service truly means. I know that I have, had, I have experienced a similar journey over and over and over again, so various journeys, whether through personal experience or by witnessing it through others. And for many years, I volunteered at a church that 
it kind of flipped my expectations of service, of what that word really means on its head. And it was about relationships, right? Relationships, relationships, relationships. I remember at this particular church, uh, the pastor that was working there at the time, um, he told me a story about their little community garden. And they had this little patch of land that was on the back side across the street from the church. And um, it, it wasn't much because it was in, it was in a city. And one day he was out there in the garden with one of the kids from the neighborhood and folks in that area, they didn't have a lot of money and the kids would come by all the time asking for blankets or food or a place to just hang out because the church was physically a safe space for them. And they knew people cared about them there. They knew they could get what they needed there. They knew where they could go. So this one particular kid knew it so well that one time they were working out in the garden together and a car drove by and the kid dropped to the ground because he knew that being seen with the pastor by a particular group of people would mean trouble for him. Yet he, keep, he kept going back again and again and again because the emotional safety of that space was worth the risk. It was worth it because love was there. That kid heard, you matter, you are valued, you are important because you are a beloved of God. Now, the same pastor, he had an office that was on the second floor of this building. It was one of those tall old churches. And it had tons of windows on this corner where his office was. And he could see of the, uh, quite a bit of the neighborhood from up there. And if he saw a drug deal going on down below while he was in the office, he'd throw on his collar and he'd walk outside and he'd say, hey, how you doing, guys? A quite possibly very dangerous act, but he did it anyway. He used his title to do good. It wasn't about showing off or making sure that people knew who he was. It was about keeping the neighborhood safe for the kids and finding ways to enter into relationships with people to make sure that folks were get getting taken care of, that they had heat in the winter and food in their fridge and blankets on their beds and a support system for not only physical, but for spiritual and emotional needs. And all it took was opening the door when someone knocked and then taking a step outside that door, and then another, and then another, to be in the world with and among people. Listening, learning, helping, and loving them, not sitting high above in an office looking down from afar. I learned a lot about service that year, those, those many years I was there. I learned that there's no one right way. <laughs> and I learned that maybe we don't always know what's best. I learned that some people appreciate it more than others, and I learned that I made assumptions about people and that needed to change. I learned that trust makes a world of difference and trust takes time and listening and stepping outside the door to build relationships with people. I wonder, have you ever had an experience that changed the way you think about service? Or is there someone in your life that made you change the way you think about it? Have you ever been on a journey like Peter's? I encourage you, you know, there's sermon notes in the bulletin. I encourage you to write that question down and take it home with you and ponder that. Right? Are there any people who, like Jesus, shocked you by taking on a role filled with humility? Anyone who, like Tabitha, lived a life filled with compassion and care for others despite little recognition? And what I love about Tabitha is that I can imagine that she empathized with those women. She understood to a certain degree their experience of being a woman, of the realities of their status, so she entered into their world and built community with them. She chose to be with and among those women. She had the means to fill a need that was there, but first she stepped outside of her doors and by so doing created a family. Because it's not about titles, and it's not about recognition. It's not about hierarchy or wealth and attribution. It is about relationships and community with people.
It's about being with and among one another, using the resources that we have to shift the systems of power that are at play and to widen our tables. And sometimes that means getting our hands and our feet a little bit dirty, and sometimes it means taking a risk, and sometimes it means no recognition. To serve and kneel at the feet of others, to care for and form a family around us, this comes from a deep sense of joy. The joy of knowing that we are beloveds of God. And it is this joy that then informs the compassion and care and the empathy and kindness that we offer to others. The joy doesn't come from the acts of service, although sometimes that's a wonderful side effect. The joy is what inspires us to go serve others. So where might your joy, your deep down in your gut, beautiful, beloved of God joy, where might it be sending you today? Where might you be called to help widen the table, to form a new relationship, and to get your hands and feet a little bit dirty? Amen. take this time in our service to make our offerings for the work that God calls us to do in our world. Um, and if you want to give online, you can do it that way too. <laughs>
Let us now make a prayer over these offerings. Gracious God, our time, our gifts, and our talents are presented to you. Take these offerings and transform them for your kingdom. May our lives be a blessing to you and a blessing to others. As we grow, may we learn to trust. As we study, may we share wisdom. As we welcome, may we all, may all come near. And as we serve, may people feel your love. Amen. Lord, hear our prayer. Great and mighty God in heaven, holy be your name. God, you are holy, and we thank you for your goodness, your kindness. You are loving and gracious. You are over everything and in everything. Lord, hear our prayer. God, we want to trust you. Help us to see the world that you dream of, a world of wholeness and justice for all creation. Lord, hear our prayer. And God, we know that there are many who are hungry in the world and in our own communities. Give us eyes to see how you want us to be a part of your provision in the world. Give us hands that share generously. Lord, hear our prayer. We confess that we are sinners in need of your grace, and we recognize that every day we also encounter people created in your image who may need our forgiveness. So give us the grace to seek your forgiveness and to forgive others. Lord, hear our prayer. God, we pray for protection in the coming week. Lead and guide us along the right paths. Be with those in places all around the world where there is violence and conflict. We especially pray for those in Gaza, Iran, and Sudan. Protect and guide them. We especially pray for those newly added to our prayers this week. We pray for Roger Anderson for healing and for those that we now name out loud or silently in our hearts. Lord, hear our prayer. We bring to you all the prayers of our hearts, trusting that you hold them with grace and love. Amen. Amen. Siblings in Christ, we now turn to this table and invite you to join us in this sacramental meal today, knowing that as we share in this meal at this table together, we grow ever closer to God, to our neighbor, and to um, ourselves. So God, we pray that this feast is one that fills our souls with comfort. May your Holy Spirit bless this bread and cup and bring us the peace that will permeate our hearts, whatever state they're in. May the Spirit use this time and space to remind us that you are within us and beside us each and every day. So with friends, Jesus shared his last supper before his death, and the group recognized the sacred in their gathering and celebrated their friendship and their community of faith. And Jesus took the bread and he blessed it. And in the breaking of bread, Jesus yearned for them to remember his teachings, their times together, and to feel his very presence among them. He told them, whenever you eat of this bread, do this in remembrance of me. And Jesus took the cup and gave thanks and said, this cup is a new covenant poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink this cup, do it in remembrance of me. As we prepare to join together for this meal, let us pray the prayer our Lord Jesus taught us, remembering with gratitude the many people who have shared this particular meal and said these words before, those beside us now, and the many who will come after. Our Creator in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The meal is ready. All are welcome at this table. Come and eat. Our ushers will guide you forward to receive your communion. Um, you receive a wafer. We have gluten-free available if needed, and we have wine and grape juice. You'll receive those as you come up to the front, move to the outside, and place your empty cups in the baskets before returning to your seats.
Let us pray. Lord Jesus, in this simple meal, you have set a feast. Sustain us on the journey, strengthen us to care for the least of your beloved children, and give us joy-filled and generous hearts as we meet you on the way. Amen. Please rise and body your spirit to receive a blessing. Go from here today, knowing that you do not go alone. That God is, God is with you, God is beside you, and share God's love with others. Amen.
suitcase, and now I have to do that farm. I'm gonna go pick up my grandson. Well, I heard you telling us when out. We're going to. It's called. How far? It's in Chester. Oh, okay. Not bad. And, um, yeah, they, right now they're only open on Sunday.